So just out of curiosity, we've had two hurricanes uh, come through our state here in the last few weeks. How many of you, is this your, it was like your first experience with hurricanes? Maybe you're new to Florida, you've never had to do that before. So we, we've got a lot of experts here, right? So how many of you is just kind of old hat? You've been doing this for a long time. You've, you've prepped for hurricane after hurricane. You've spent more than a week without power in the aftermath of a hurricane. Show of hands, right? Yeah, we, many of us have been there. I've ridden out a, a, a Category 5 hurricane before. It's no fun. We, we don't like hurricanes. I especially don't like hurricane prep. And I'm not a big fan of prepping for a hurricane and then it not showing up, right? You know, I put everything in my garage. I was all ready. And then you, I couldn't even tell it was raining sitting in my house, right? I didn't, my power didn't even blip. I was so thankful, but a, a little let down because I was ready for a storm, right? And, and so uh, here's the thing. If you've been in Florida any length of time, you've had to prepare for it and then either flee or ride out a storm. But it isn't just Florida residents that have to prep for and weather storms. Everybody has to. We all do. Doesn't matter where you live, there are literal storms that hit from time to time. Could be an F5 tornado if it's not a Category 5 hurricane. But it's not just literal storms that hit us. Figurative storms hit all the time. Truth is, we're much more likely to get hit by figurative storms than we are literal storms. I, 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 can, I can say this with 100% certainty. Storms are coming. And that's true regardless of where you live. It's true literally. It's true figuratively. We're, we're, the truth is, we are all just a day, a week, or a month away from some figurative storm hitting our lives. Could be a bad visit to the doctor. Could be bad news from your employer. Could be your spouse makes a terrible decision. Could be one of your children make a terrible decision. Could be you made a terrible decision. Or maybe someone hurt us. In a very real, tangible way, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we've all been there, right? We've been injured. We've experienced trauma. Or maybe a financial storm's hit your life. You've been struggling financially, getting by. You feel like you've finally got your head above water, and then the engine on your car blows up. Or you're a senior adult on a fixed income and you, feel you, got, you got your house that you worked your whole life for and then you discover there's termite damage or the roof's got to be replaced and you just don't know where the money is going to come from. Or you're on a fixed income and at the end of the month you're having to make decisions between food and medicine. Right? Storms are coming. And storms come all the time, over and over and over again, because we are broken people living in a broken world surrounded by other broken people. And the Scriptures warn us about the storms, and the Scriptures actually teach us how to storm-proof our lives to some degree. I want you to open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27 as our launching off point this morning. Here, here's what King Jesus says. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Listen to me, folks. Storms are coming. You've got two choices. You can be prepared or you can be unprepared. 
Storms are coming. You've got two choices. Be prepared or be unprepared. Now, we're, we're, we're in the middle of a sermon series on raising the future generation to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about parenting, right? Families of faith. And so last week, I challenged all of our parents and reminded them that you are the primary faith trainers of your children. To your young people, listen, there's going to be a time when you have kids and you're going to be the primary faith trainers of your children. If you're grandparents, you're still the primary faith trainers and investors in your children. You care about them more than anybody else, and you now have an added responsibility to help them to invest in your grandchildren. And then, of course, we all have our extended spiritual family, and we have a responsibility for raising the next generation to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of our responsibilities as the primary faith trainers of future generations is to prepare those who come after us to endure the storms of life. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we storm-proof our lives? How do we help our children storm-proof their lives? Well, we do it by building on the rock. As we think about that, and this, this command to build on the rock, what does Jesus say? You know, the, the rock is the teaching of Jesus Christ. It's the Word of God. And we storm-proof our lives by building them on the teaching of God's Word. Now, listen to me. When I say storm-proof, that doesn't mean you're not going to get hit by storms. I didn't say storm invisibility. I said storm-proof. We're all going to be hit by storms frequently. Storm-proof means that what we're building survives the storm. Stormproof means that we're ready when they arrive, and that only happens if you build on the rock of God's Word. Now, show of hands again. How many of you guys have been through a hurricane? All right. Let me ask you a question. I, I actually had to, I rode out Hurricane Irma down in South Florida. So it was, you know, Category 5 when it went over us, and then it went out in the Gulf and turned around and came back and hit y'all, right? So we, we both went through that. And I remember when that thing hit. And we had to put hurricane shutters up all around our house. We had to park our vehicles up close to the house. We had to do the same thing at our church. I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot of prep work. And I had one tiny little window where I could look outside my house that wasn't covered by a storm uh, protector. And I was blown away by how strong the winds were. There would have been no way possible for me to storm-proof my life in the midst of the storm. Once the wind and the rain get there, you're either prepared or you're unprepared. And the wise pilot sets his instruments before he flies into the storm, not in the midst of the storm. So we, we have to build on the rock when our lives aren't falling apart. We have to get used to going to the Word of God when things are fairly easy, so when things get hard, we're used to being there. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Pastor Jonathan read this verse earlier. The Bible says, Where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Another translation says, you know, where, there's, where there's no vision, the people perish. The point of this proverb is simple. When we lose sight of God's Word, we struggle. When we lose sight of God's Word, we sin. When we lose sight of God's Word, we perish. The storm is coming. The question is, will you be prepared for the storm? Parents, the storm is coming for your children. Will your, parent, will your children be prepared for the storm? One significant verse that really drives our discipleship strategy as a church and drives all of our ministries is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. There the Bible says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. And basically what that verse teaches us is that everything we need for life and godliness is contained within God's Word. 
You, you, you want to learn how to be the dad God wants you to be, the mom God wants you to be, the, uh, the husband God wants you to be, the wife God wants you to be, the neighbor God wants you to be? You find it in God's Word. You want to learn how to have a right relationship with God, how to walk after the Lord Jesus Christ? You find it in God's Word. Everything we need for life and godliness is contained with, within His Word, which is the rock upon which we build. So how do we prepare for the storms of life? We do it by aligning our lives with God's design. How do we prepare our children for the storms of life? By teaching them and equipping them to align their lives with God's design. And here's the good news. We, we don't have to lay a foundation. Jesus Christ has already done that for us. Our job is to build on that foundation. Jesus has done everything for us. We trust in him and follow him. So how do we storm-proof our lives? We build on the rock. Now the question is, how do we build on the rock? Well, according to Jesus, we do it by hearing and doing the word of God. This idea of hearing is more than just hearing the preacher read the scriptures. It's actually opening our hearts up, receiving them, and then putting them into practice. Doesn't matter how much Scripture you know if you're not trying to live out the Scripture that you do know. So how do we build on the rock? We do it by hearing and doing the Word. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6, our focal verse from last week. The Bible there, God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And the emphasis is what? That the Word of God is going to be central to to everything we do as a family, to everything we do as individuals. We're going to think about it when we rise, when we sit, when we walk and when we run, when we stand still. God's Word has a bearing on everything we do. And that's why it's important to remember that everything we need for life and godliness is contained within the pages of Holy Scripture. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, wrote these words, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So there's this command. Don't be conformed to the world around you, but be transformed what? by the renewing of your mind. So as the Word of God, the ancient words that we sang about earlier, are, 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 as we think about them, as we meditate on them, as we learn them, as we hear them and do them in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, they equip us to see the world as it really is. They equip us to make wise decisions. They help us to be prepared for the coming storms. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul gives a, a warning to us. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So the Bible teaches us that there's really two ways to view the world. There's a way that is contrary to the Word of God, and there's a way that's consistent with the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul warns us, don't fall captive, don't fall prey to the lies of the enemy, to the lies of the world. Submit yourself, give yourself over to the teaching of God's Word, because ultimately that is how you build on the rock. How do we build on the rock? We hear and do the Word. We teach our children to do the same, to view God's Word as words of life. Not words of restriction, words of life. Not words that steal our joy, but words that give us joy. Words that save us, strengthen us, and empower us. We hear and do the Word, and we teach our children to do the same. See, the goal of parents as the primary faith trainers of their children is to commit themselves to God's Word. That means we teach our children stewardship, service, 
how to have grace-based relationships with others, how to love their enemies, how to discern truth from error, how to forgive, how to love, how to pray. Parents, listen to me. This is a very important truth for you to grasp. Our kids start building the moment they start thinking. The challenge is to build our lives on the rock. To, to, to learn to view the world through the lens of Scripture. Our children start thinking about the world. They start building on the sand the moment they start thinking. So what do you mean? Well, as soon as your children start thinking, they begin to evaluate the world around them and where they fit into that world. They begin to make value judgments about themselves and others. They begin to make decisions about what is wrong with the world and why. And it's our job to teach them to make those judgments based on the Word of God. I want to think about this now. Right? Our children... Well, when they're little, we, we kind of teach them that the world revolves around them. I mean, think about what it would be like to be an 18-month-old or a two-year-old. You come into the room and everybody smiles. They, they stand to greet you. They, they ooh and ah over you. I mean, you gradually begin to think, I bring joy to the world. The world is a better place because I live in it. They're here to serve me. I go to the bathroom, they clean up after me. I'm hungry, they bring me food. If I'm having a bad day, they even put the food in my mouth. I mean, our children grow up and they, they, they think the world revolves around them. Now, add to that the fact that they're born with a sin nature. Our children are inherently selfish. We don't have to teach them how to lie. That comes instinctively to them. We don't teach them how to say no. For some, Somehow they learn that word on their own. We have to teach them to share, not to be stingy. Right? So this sin, they begin to make evaluations of the world around them. It's our job to teach them to make those judgments based on the Word of God, to instill in them what we call a biblical worldview, to teach them to view the world through the lens of Scripture. Now, as I, I, I've gotten older, my eyes have decided to age faster than the rest of my body. And so what that means is I'm, I'm very thankful for long arms because I'm always losing my glasses and I can't sign receipts when I go out to eat without really long arms, or I have to get my phone out and take a picture and blow it up to see what the total is on my bill, because I can't read it, right? You know, and I just, I bought, you know, and so I have to wear readers, but I always lose readers, so every once in a while I'll go and I'll buy really nice glasses that are basically readers on the bottom and blank on the top, and, but I can wear them all the time, and I'm less likely to lose them. And I, even then, I lost them again. So my wife's not happy with me because those glasses aren't cheap. You know, but it's amazing. I get a book out and I look at it and I just see a blur. I put my glasses on and I can read it. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all have to wear your glasses all the time. I remember when we found out my son had some vision problems. And they, weren't, they weren't bad, but we, had, we, we took him and got glasses when he was a teenager. And he could read, but he had some distance issues. And I'll never forget that we were standing outside my truck the first time he put his glasses on outside. And he goes, I can see individual leaves on the tree. This is awesome. Apparently before that, he just saw green splotches off in the sky, right? You know, it was just, it was amazing. The, the world came, became clearer to him when he put his glasses on. Well, when we talk about a biblical worldview, we're learning to view the world through the lens of Scripture not through the lens of our selfish nature, the lens uh, through what the world tells us is in the world, but through what God's Word tells us is in the world, right? We, 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 we have to teach our children as parents, as, as children's ministry workers, 
to let the Bible be the lens through which we interpret the world around us. In essence, our goal is to teach our children to think and live like Jesus, to make value judgments about the world around us the same way Jesus does. Now, if you think about that as a parent, that sounds like a very daunting task, especially if you just started walking with the Lord. Sounds like a very daunting task. Truth is, it's a daunting task even if you have a PhD in theology. I spent 12 years in theological education getting my degrees, and it's still a daunting thing to think that I, I was responsible for training my children to evaluate the world through the lens of Scripture. But folks, there's a reason why God gives you the task of raising your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There's a reason God gives you the task of instilling in your children a biblical worldview and doesn't give it to me. Doesn't give it to anybody else. He gives it to you because you love your kids enough to do it. He gives that task to you because with God's help, and the strength of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you can actually do it. As we said this last week, I'm going to say it again. You can do it. We can help. It's your job to raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's our job as a church to come alongside you and to help you, to equip you, to inspire you, to pray for you, and to help you do the job that God's given you to do. And by the way, this church is absolutely committed to doing that to the very best of our ability. We care a great deal about strong families. So one of our core values is that strong families are developed as they discover and pursue God's design for life. Right? We're committed to learning to follow God's Word. So I want to tell you a little bit about our, 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 our kids' ministry, our preschool ministry, our student ministry. We, I, I, want, I want to challenge you to think of them differently. Right? Don't think of them as schools where you drop your kids off. Don't think of them as ministry time so you can come and sit under the preaching of the Word of God while someone else is changing their diaper and feeding them goldfish and, and basically keeping them out of your hair. Although there are times when you're thankful for that, right? I, I need you to think of our children and student ministries as ministry partnerships. Right? So as a church, we have ministry partnerships with a number of different organizations. We have a partnership with a church up in Rhode Island tiny little church, faith community church. They're, they're in a kind of a, a struggling neighborhood, and it's a smaller church. They have a lot of resources. So what do we do? We go up once or twice a year. We provide resources. We, we, we do work on their building. We go out and canvas in their neighborhoods. We build relationships with their members. We invest in their pastor. We encourage them. But we recognize that they're the ones doing the work of ministry. We come alongside to help them do the work. That's exactly why our children's and student ministries exist. It's not to do the work for you. It's to come alongside and supplement the work that God wants you to do. If you're hoping that First Baptist Church Middleburg is going to raise your children for you, that, that's a failing plan from the beginning. I mean, folks... At the very best, we might get your kids for three hours a week. And I say three hours a week if you're here for two hours on Sunday morning, that's worship and small group, Sunday school, and you come back on Wednesday night. And you're here every week, which a majority of Christians no longer do every week. Used to be you were an active member if you were at church three times a week. Now you're an active member if you come to church twice a month. All right? So at most, we get uh, uh, your kids one to three hours a week. Listen to me. School gets them for 40 hours a week. TV, Instagram, Snapchat, and YouTube gets them for hours more. If you want your children to live and think like Jesus, if you want your children to follow Jesus in faith, it's going to require you to invest in them. See, our preschool children and student ministries, uh, they're designed to teach biblical concepts, content, and application to our children to help form Christian character in our children. 
We plant seeds alongside parents. We cultivate seeds alongside parents. But parents are the real heroes. They are the front line workers that make a difference. They are the first responders in the faith. You can do it. We can help. And if you will embrace your role as the primary faith trainer of future generations, and you will view our preschool children and student ministries as supplemental partnerships, it will have a tremendous impact on the growth and well-being of your children. Each of our family ministries provides discipleship tools that help parents continue the conversation that starts at church each week. So I I just want to get intensely practical here and tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do. Now, we, we, we teach our kids, assuming there are going to be a lot of them that don't have any spiritual conversations at home, right? So we want to give them the very basics. But our goal is to start a conversation that continues at home. And that's why at each level of our ministry, we send resources home with our parents to empower you to have conversations with your children. You get some handouts so you can see what your kids learn, some devotional ideas so you can have conversations throughout the week. And and guys, listen to me. If, you'll, if you've never taken advantage of that, let me just challenge you to do it today, right? If you'll just have a conversation with your kid on the way home, ask them what they learned. Tell, ask them to tell you about what they did in small group, in Sunday school, in kids' church. You'll be doing what 90% of parents in the country aren't. If you've got students that come to our student ministry on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, Pastor Mark actually sends out a monthly email previewing the topics they're going to talk about over the next month, giving you devotional ideas, letting you know what's coming down the pipe so you can have spiritual conversations with your children. Pastor Jake has provided a number of resources for our children, and we're going to have a a, a display set up next week sharing some more of those, but uh, simple ideas for having devotions with our kids, uh, resources for how to parent, how how to counsel, those types of things. It's all designed to help you. You can do it. We can help. Now, parents are the front line, but I want to, I'm going to say a word to our volunteers. Now, just because the primary faith trainer of future generations is the parent doesn't mean that our volunteers don't make a real lasting difference in the lives of others as they serve. I was saved at the age of 17. I had a pastor, Lewis Kennison. I had a student pastor who was also our worship pastor. His name was Dave. I had a Sunday school teacher named Jimmy Lep- Jimmy Lepley. They all had a huge impact on me as a young man who was figuring out what it meant to be a Christian. But so too did a number of other men in my church. We had some, what I thought at the time were old men. Now I realize they were just 30 and uh, early 40s, but they played softball. And I got saved, and they're like, hey, here's a young kid that can hit, and he's fast, and he can throw a ball. We'll put him in left field. Chris, you want to play softball with us? And so every Saturday, I started going to these softball tournaments and playing ball with these guys. And what they would do is they would take me to lunch. They'd feed me sunnies in between games, and they would talk about the Lord and what it meant to follow Jesus. And they they would ask me how I was doing. I learned as much from them as I ever did any sermon I heard. They had a huge impact on me. But so too did a man by the name of Linwood Bond. Never was in a small group with Linwood. Never played softball with Linwood. Linwood was an old man with one tooth. And he'd laugh and you'd see that one tooth. He was a greeter in our church. He, he was pushing 80 when I knew him. And I would walk by him every day, and he had a stack of bulletins, and he'd hand me a bulletin. And after I'd been coming a couple of months, he'd learn my name, and he'd shake my hand. Hey, hey, Brother Chris, how you doing today? And then he would just start to, every other week, have a 30-second to two-minute conversation with me, and he would tell me something about Jesus. 
He'd shake my hand, pull me in. He'd say, how you doing, Chris? You going to school? You need to get that education. That education's important. Don't quit school. A lot of young men make bad mistakes. They quit school. You keep going to school. I'd come in next week. He'd shake my hand. He'd pull me in. Chris, you got a job? Godly man's a working man. You need to have a job. You need to be working. You got a job? Yes, sir, I got a job. All right, you make sure you show up and work hard. Come a time when you got to provide for your family, take care of your family. A godly man takes care of his family. And so every week, Linwood Bond would just pull me in and encourage me and inspire me. And long before I ever had a, a lesson about what a Christian work ethic was or taking care of a family or leading my family, I learned those lessons from an old greeter standing under the portico at Wingate Road Baptist Church. I'll never forget Linwood Bond. I'll also never forget the day he finally broke down and got dentures. Because I showed up and he smiled. And man, those things just jumped out at me. All of a sudden he had teeth. Linwood Bond had a huge impact on me. Folks, listen, it doesn't matter where you serve. Everyone who serves, everyone who gives, everyone who prays has a profound impact on future generations. So as we continue to walk through this idea of parents being the primary faith trainers of our children, don't forget that you too make a difference. And I want to challenge our parents this morning. And I'm going to give you a very simple next step. I want to challenge you to have an intentional, spiritual conversation with your child or student. Now, if you're a volunteer here today, I want to challenge you to have a conversation with someone else. This is discipleship. Having spiritual conversations about the Lord, talking about the Lord, talking about His Word, that is discipleship. And there, there are two different ways that can take place in the family. And, uh, there's, and, and this, this, I heard these phrases this week and I love them. So one, there's trickle-down discipleship. Now I remember, a lot of us remember trickle-down economics from Reagan, right? Um, so trickle-down discipleship is when you have a conversation with your children about what you learned in small groups, Sunday school, church, or you learned in your devotional time. Hey, little Johnny, did I, did I tell you what God taught me? Let me tell you what we learned in Sunday school today. We talked about the book of Genesis. We talked about Joseph getting sold into slavery by his brothers. Can you imagine that happening, Right? So trickle down. You're taking what you've learned and you're passing it down to your children. Then there's trickle up discipleship. That's where you go to little Johnny and ask Johnny what he learned in children's church, what he learned in Sunday school, what he learned in church. Hey, what'd you learn today? What'd you learn tonight, Wednesday night? And you ask them questions. And this is important because when you ask them questions about what they learned, you're reminding them that it's important what they're learning. And as they explain it to you, you're giving them an opportunity to own the truth and you're giving it an opportunity to solidify in their lives. By the way, you're never too old to engage in trickle-down or trickle-up discipleship. If you're 60 years old today, you can have a conversation with your 35-year-old son and tell him what God's doing in your life. You know, in our next service, we're going to baptize a 60-year-old man. That's exciting, right? It's rare someone comes to faith in Christ that age. We're also going to baptize his 37-year-old son who saw his dad decide to follow Jesus and then called up and wanted to talk about him following Jesus, right? Your example makes a difference in the lives of others. It's never too old to have a trickle up or a trickle down conversation with someone else so if you got grown children have a spiritual conversation with them hey kids if you have if your parents aren't calling you you call them you have a spiritual conversation with your parents because discipleship doesn't happen unless we do so as we as we end today i want to give you four conversation starters parents that you can use this week to initiate a spiritual conversation with your children all right and remember so this last week, your kids actually want to talk to you. But if you haven't done it in a while, it may be hard to get the conversation going, right? The door's open, but it's heavy. There are four conversation starters. Number one, what are some challenges you're facing? Just say, hey, what, what's going on in your life? What, what, what are some challenges that you're facing in your life right now? Tell me what's happening. Well, first time you ask, it might be nothing. 
But you keep asking, be impatient. You're going to get something from them. Question two, what's the best or worst thing that happened to you in the last week? Not answer would be wildly different depending on the kid and what age they are and what's going on in their life. And even if they don't tell you everything that happened, when you ask that question, you're communicating to them that you actually care about what happened. And our kids need to be reminded constantly that we care about them. Because the enemy tries to convince them that we don't. Question number three, what's one thing, what one thing do you find yourself thinking about the most? I'm not saying ask all of these back to back in a five minute conversation. Just pick one, right? Hey, just curious when you're daydreaming, when you're riding the bus, when you're sitting in your room, what, what, what one thing do you find yourself thinking about the most? Could be Transformers, could be Spider-Man, it could be a bully. It could be their fears about how they look, their strengths or weaknesses. Fourth, is there something I can help you with? Is there anything going on in your life that mom or dad could help you with? Just, just ask them. First time you ask them and they haven't thought about it, nah. You, you could help me and do my homework. I mean, you might get, you know, but you, you keep asking that question, keep pushing that door open. Eventually you're going to get to some deeper stuff. But you don't get to the deeper stuff unless you tread through the shallow water first. So initiate a conversation with your kids this week. Just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song in response. And, and, and here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray for you right now. And as we stand to sing, I want to invite all of our parents, come forward and pray for your children. Come forward and pray for yourselves. You'll be bold to start a conversation this week. Let me pray for you and we'll respond. Father, we love you. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this opportunity to gather together in worship. And Lord, as we prepare to stand and respond, I pray that we'd respond in faith. That we'd respond by surrendering our lives to you. By lifting our children up to you in prayer. And Lord, I pray that you'd make this prayer time an opportunity for us to recommit our lives to raising our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? If you have kids, you need to pray for